Welcome to the New Wealth Wave podcast hosted by Dr. Joaquin Wallace. We're diving deep into the intricate layers of the seven stage generational wealth model to offer invaluable insights on legacy building, wealth accumulation and preservation and financial growth across generations. I'm Dr. Joaquin Wallace, and this is the New Wealth Wave podcast. Hey, future wealth builders, this is Dr. Joaquin Wallace, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on the New Wealth Wave podcast. First episode with an actual live guest here with this afternoon with us, Martin Johnson Esquire. Today, we're going to talk about the generational wealth model. We're going to focus on stages six and seven on the model itself. And if you're watching on YouTube, you will see the model on visual. You can follow us as well on there. And if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, you can click on the link to follow along. I hope you take a lot of notes. This is going to be a very impactful podcast this afternoon. So welcome, Mr. Martin C. Johnson, Esquire, estate planning attorney. Thank you for joining this afternoon. Thank you very much for having me, doctor. It's a pleasure to be here. So to be transparent, you know, me and Martin is, has done business for quite some time now. And in fact, Martin did my estate plan a few months back as well. So well, I have to practice what I preach. And so, you know, Martin has, has been influential in developing my estate plan. And also Martin and I kind of worked on the model itself. He would be my sounding board as we was going through the model, the stages, if you will, the icon. So I'm thankful for that uh, as well. So again, thank you for coming on to the podcast this afternoon. So before we get started with all of the deep, heavy lifting, Martin, tell us one fun fact about yourself? Well, one fun fact about me, doctor, is that years ago, I was actually a flight attendant. For two years, I flew for an airline that is no longer around, and that was Northwest Airlines. So I think that's a fun fact that I like to share with folks. I never would have known that. But also mention the fact before we were on air, you was doing some radio DJing as well. Let's talk about that. Back in the late 70s, I worked at a college radio station, KUOP 91.3 FM, the University of the Pacific's college radio station. Did that for a couple of years, did some commercial radio after that. But we had the number one R&B show in the Valley, Saturdays from noon until 3 p.m. Everybody knew me as Marty J back in those days. See, that's another fun fact. I, I didn't know that as well. So, you know, just get a little bit of background on Martin. Martin Johnson is a dedicated estate planning attorney with a passion of helping individuals and families. Martin Focus is assisting singles, married couples, and blended families in navigating the complexities of establishing flexible estate plans that adapt to the present needs and future changes. His firm is committed to delivering exceptional service and support throughout the planning process, providing peace of mind to clients and their loved ones. With a loving wife of 27 years and two children, Martin appreciates the blessings in life. His daughter is a graduate of University of Notre Dame. His son is a graduate of Seattle University. So Martin, you know, you had a chance to review the model. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, we kind of went through the model itself. You know, where do you see many of your clients in the model? Most of my clients are kind of in two different areas of the model. A lot of them are in stage four of the model, the financial edification stage. But then there's also clients who are in stage six, the generational knowledge stage. But once again, they're in these stages, but they haven't mastered all of the stages. But that's where they tend to be, stage four and stage six. So let me ask you another question. So in regards to the model itself, stage four is financial edification, right? Which is two sides to that, which is financial literacy and financial inclusion. And then stage six is generational knowledge. We've said throughout that generational wealth begins with generational knowledge, right? And so when you look at it from That's that correct. perspective, let me ask you, where are you on the model? I would say I'm definitely at stage six. My children already are talking about their own estate plans. So I've gone through all of these stages myself. I definitely think I could be better off in the financial well-being. You know, I don't want to settle for where I am, but I believe I'm at stage six. 
looking at the model itself, stage one is the internal and external ecosystem. Stage two is financial genetic code. Stage three is reprogramming your financial genetic code, which is financial healing. Stage four is financial edification. Stage five, as you mentioned, financial well-being, which we're all trying to try to get to. Stage six is generational knowledge. And stage seven is creating those footprints for generational wealth. With that being said, you know, what is the biggest hurdle you find in estate planning and getting clients to invest in an estate plan? The biggest hurdles, there's a couple of hurdles. One hurdle is people are overwhelmed with just dealing with the eventuality of their own demise. A lot of people don't want to talk about death and don't even want to deal with it. They're too involved in the being present and dealing with the issues of today. For those people who are kind of thinking about estate planning, some of them are being held back because of just lack of knowledge and fear. They have heard things, maybe it's expensive, it takes a lot of time. And then I would say the number one hurdle is people believe that estate planning is only for rich people or very wealthy people. And there's nothing further from the truth. You know, that's interesting because, again, I mentioned the fact that you did my estate plan and, you know, I was one of those thinking of the same thing. You know, it's really for rich people and really didn't understand the power of estate planning. Now, being a financial advisor, obviously, you start learning more and more about it. And, And during my fact finding, one of the things that I do is I always ask, do you have an estate plan? And and it's interesting that 100 percent. I would say 99.9% of my clients who I meet with do not have an estate plan in place. And so when I'm talking to my clients, one of the things I always mention, how are you going to transfer your assets? Because we're working so hard, we don't understand how important that is in terms of probate and things of that nature. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But when I'm going through my fact finding with my clients, one of the things that I always recommend is that you need to get an estate plan in place. Once they're introduced to it, then it's not as foreign. You can break down a lot of those hidden barriers, so to speak, that those misnomers that we mentioned earlier that people think is expensive, that's not for them. Mm -hmm. They don't have the Mm -hmm. assets in place. All of those are incorrect. But again, you know, we don't have those communications in our communities to really talk about the importance of estate planning. When you ask, do they have an estate plan? Is there anyone who's ever said, what are you talking about? I don't know what an estate plan is. One of the things they really don't know the difference between a trust and an estate plan. <laughs> What's the difference okay. between the two? And I didn't know the difference <laughs> between a trust and a estate plan. And I was in a financial advising business itself, right? As I got educated more and more, I start talking to individuals and start reading about the importance of having it. But the biggest thing that shied me away from getting an estate plan, I felt I didn't have any assets. Why would I need an estate plan? At the time, I didn't own a home. Those are things that you think that you need to have an estate plan and you look at those individuals who are rich and famous or if you would have those resources and have an estate plan in place financially their net worth is much higher than ours. I really didn't understand that anyone can get an estate plan and the importance of having an estate plan. So with that, let's dive into the next question. So please tell our audience what estate planning is. Estate planning in its simplest form is a concerted effort, a true plan to make provisions for transferring wealth from one generation to the next or from you to your heirs. And those heirs could be in the same generation, but very simply, it's just making plans to transfer wealth. That's at a high level. We can always dig a little deeper into the actual components of an estate plan. And so when the generational wealth model, you know, why it was important to bring you on today, because the purpose of the model is to help those and educate to how to get to generational wealth, because there's a lot of narratives that are out there that that speak about generational wealth. But again, without generational knowledge, there is no generational wealth. And oftentimes we find that people are constantly talking about generational wealth, what you need to do to get to generational wealth. But at the end of the day, the planning piece is always kind of omitted in that process. The model itself, what I love about it, because it's a fluid model, And one of the questions why I asked you was, you know, where do you see yourself on the model? Stage four or stage five and stage six and seven, right? Because it's so important. And I felt that having you on the first guest can kind of bring the model into play and why it's important because the listeners need to know, yes, 
in order for you to get generational wealth, you have to go through the stage of generational knowledge. And we're talking about stage one all the way to stage six to create your financial footprints to stage seven. So, you know, why is estate planning important to do so as early as possible? Well, the number one reason is that we never know when our last day on earth is going to be. And so the sooner you prepare for it, the better. Many people uh, believe that it's something that only older people do. But what if you're in an accident and you die? What if you're in an accident and you become incapacitated? and you can't do planning in those kind of situations. So that's why you should do it as early as possible. And based on your current financial situation, there is an estate plan that's meant for every level of wealth, so to speak. I want to go back to the planning for your demise. As you mentioned, that's one of the conversations that we don't like to talk about. But one thing that I always mention to my clients, there's less than a 1% chance you're going to pass away today but it's a 100% chance that it's going to happen. It's a 20% chance that you're going to be, right? It's a 20% chance that you're going to become disabled. And you mentioned the incapacitated piece of it all. You find that mm -hmm. often a lot with a lot of clients or individuals who don't have estate planning in place and they're not able to make those decisions, whether it's irrevocable or revocable trust. So talk about the difference between irrevocable and a revocable trust. Revocable trusts can be changed, meaning they can be modified, the terms can be changed, beneficiaries can be changed, trustees can be changed, the assets in the trust can be changed. With an irrevocable trust, it cannot be revoked. Once the trustor creates the trust, it is set in stone. There is no way to change the moving pieces, and those are the primary differences. Now, you would ask, why would someone even create an irrevocable trust? The primary reason for an irrevocable trust are tax benefits, because once you put assets into an irrevocable trust, they are out of your name. And that is what reduces tax liability. And generally, they're really used by very wealthy families to reduce the estate tax that their family may have to pay when they die. Is a living trust the same as an estate plan? No. An estate plan is a comprehensive plan of several different documents and planning, whereas a living trust is a component of estate planning. So if you think about estate planning as a package, then you ask, well, what's in the package? A living trust is one of the items in the package. And if I could take it a step further, a living trust is like a box that's in the package and we put our assets into the box and that living trust gives us certain benefits that help our family save money and time when we die. You know, oftentimes you get the question of if I have a life insurance policy, right? So I have a life insurance policy. Should I make the beneficiaries the trust? And that's a question that comes up from time to time. What's the pros and cons of naming the beneficiaries of the trust for your life insurance policy? Okay, that's a great question, and I'm sure it comes up quite often. It definitely comes up when people have finally decided to do a living trust, and then they ask me, well, what should I do with the life insurance? And it does depend on your family situation. An example of the benefit of having your life insurance go to the trust or having your trust be the beneficiary of the life insurance is ultimate control. Your trustee has ultimate control over that money as to who gets it, when they get it, how often they get it. Versus if the life policy has a designated beneficiary, let's say it's an individual who's 21 years old. When the policyholder dies, that death benefit, let's say it's a million dollars, is going to go to that 21-year-old person with no strings attached. Now, I ask our audience and I ask you, if you were 21 years old and received a million dollars, do you think you would do the right thing with that money? No, I definitely and the answer, go back to my internal and external ecosystem. <laughs> I right, wouldn't know what to right. do with that because I wouldn't have no planning itself. Right. 
Exactly. So when a individual is a beneficiary, the money goes to them outright and it's theirs. They can do anything they want. But if the money goes to the trust, it's the trustee we're hoping who is someone who obviously you trust. They are a well-organized person. They know the family and they can make decisions to disperse money to your beneficiaries, to that 21 year old person. Once again, if we use a million dollar example, maybe we give them 50 or 60,000 at age 21 to help them finish school. Then they get another chunk at age 25. They get another chunk at age 30 and maybe at age 35, you give them the remainder. These are all things that you design in the trust so that your children don't squander the money and you do have an opportunity to build generational wealth because now by the time that person is 35, you would hope that they have a better head on their shoulders. They're making more responsible decisions. And this is where the consulting and the advisory and the experience of a great estate planner comes in because they can walk you through all of your options. You know, another piece that I want to talk about in regards to estate plan that me and, and my family came into was the idea of providing and having a fiduciary. Didn't really know the level of a fiduciary, why a fiduciary can be important. Using myself as an example, we have three daughters. And so we didn't want the pressure of those three dollars to make those decisions. So a fiduciary can be that person as well that within the plan itself can structure it and do the things that you mentioned earlier. Could you talk about the pros and cons if they are for adding a fiduciary? A professional fiduciary is a designation, is a profession that many states recognize. California is one of those states that recognizes professional fiduciaries. They have to be licensed and bonded, and they also have to go through extensive training. So these people are trained basically to manage money and assets for other people. Primarily, their clients tend to be elderly folks, older people, maybe people who have disabilities. They manage money for minors. So it varies. But so these are people who can come in. They're used to managing property. They're used to managing investments and they don't have a dog in the fight, so to speak. So you use the example of your three daughters. Many clients will want to name one or two of their children to be what we call successor trustees. So when they die, they may designate two of their daughters to be the trustees. Okay. So imagine you have three daughters, you've named two of them to be co-trustees. How do you think the third one feels? Okay. And maybe you've done that because the third one has had issues with responsibility. They have bad credit. They're just not good handlers of money. Even though those are the facts, it still puts a little bad taste in the mouth of the person who was left out. All right. So let's say you name all three of these people as co-successor trustees. Well, the probate code states that decisions by co-trustees must be unanimous. All right. So now how often do you think three people with three different personalities are going to come to the same conclusion? And a lot of parents say, oh, my kids, they get along. They'll never fight. They'll never argue. Right. But when a million dollars or two million or four or ten million dollars are at stake, somebody's going to say, hey, I want to do this. The other person's going to say, I want to do that. So that's kind of the setup to solve this problem. You can hire a professional fiduciary who has to keep your three daughters best interests at the forefront. So there are several professional fiduciaries in the Bay Area. Some of them have large staff. Some of them are smaller. But the number one thing they do is they manage money and they have to follow the terms of the trust. So if your trust states that this property is to be sold and the assets split among the three daughters, that's what the professional fiduciary will do. When you die or when the second spouse dies, professional fiduciary steps in, 
they go through the trust administration process, they sell the property, and they divide the money according to what you and your spouse or significant other or domestic partner have written in the trust. Because otherwise, if it's not clearly written, one of the daughters or both two of them may say, well, let's just keep the property, let's rent it out. The third person says, no, I need the money. I have two kids in college. So you see how these dynamics can start to wreak havoc if you don't do proper planning. So I really can't think of a con to hiring a professional fiduciary other than the fact that you are gonna have to pay for these services. When I'm going through my fact finding, when I'm recommending a lot of my clients to estate planners, you know, one of the things that I always mention, the fiduciary, and I bring up my personal experience with it as well to say, this is why we did it. But I've heard so many stories when we were interviewing fiduciaries because you need to do your due diligence with your fiduciaries as well. And you hear these stories about how the money is still in probate, property in probate, things of that nature. They're not getting along. We're talking about two, three years in fighting within the families itself. Right. So the fiduciary can eliminate all of that and it's allow them to do the job first and you're comfortable at the end of the day because you know once you explain it to your family when you have your meeting with your state plan saying here's the plan itself this is the components of the plan and we're going to get to that we have a fiduciary who's actually responsible for doing the things that we said within the plan itself and it eliminates like you said the infighting of the family members it allows all of your wishes to go through as smoothly as possible when that time comes what are the components of a comprehensive estate plan? The components of a comprehensive estate plan, first of all, it does depend on your current situation. So let's use a person or persons who own property and have children. And then I can give you an example of an estate plan for someone who may not have property or children. But let's say the typical client that you come across or I come across it's usually a couple or a single individual who owns property in California. They may or may not have a child. So for that person, the foundational component of the estate plan will be the revocable living trust. The next component would be what we call a pour over will. And I can go back and give you a little more insight on each of these components, but they are very important. The next thing is a, a cert certificate of trust is needed, an advance health care directive, a living will, a HIPAA authorization. I believe HIPAA came into effect in the early 2000s, maybe late 1990s, where Congress passed a law that basically stated that health care professionals and organizations cannot share medical information without permission of the person whose information is being shared. So at this stage in the game, if you wanted to get your wife's healthcare information, you would be prohibited unless she gave you authorization. So imagine, you know, you have a loved one that's been in an accident, they're rushed to the hospital, and you're married to that person. You go to the hospital and say, hey, what's her condition? By law, they're not supposed to share medical information with you. So the HIPAA authorization is a document we draft for our clients so that they have it on file with their health care provider, but they also have a copy in their estate document. So if they do go to the hospital and need information on a loved one, they can show the HIPAA authorization that's been signed and notarized by that loved one stating that the medical providers can share information. And Dr. Joaquin, I hope your listeners are listening to this very intently because the number one issue we run into with lack of HIPAA authorizations is when parents have children who are over 18 and they're in college or something happens to them and their parents need to get medical information. If they do not have a HIPAA authorization from their child, the university, medical director, hospitals, HMOs, Kaiser are not supposed to share that information with you. And this is major because these are young adults away from home or maybe even living at home. But if you don't have HIPAA authorization, it can be rough time getting information on a loved one who's injured or incapacitated. 
And so I was going to say, so that's why it's important. And when we're talking about generational wealth, that's why generational knowledge stage six is so important. The planning piece of it, because these are instances that happen every day. And while you're telling that story, you know, and I was thinking about, you know, a situation where you may have gotten divorced. Now you're with a new wife or a new spouse and your estate plan has not been updated. And so now the new yes. spouse is not allowed to get that information because the estate plan is not updated. So, I mean, it's so important, right, to make sure you're updating your information really and put your planning in place. So I know we talked about the HIPAA. I know you have a couple other ones as well. Yes. A durable power of attorney. And this is a very important component. The durable power of attorney allows you to designate one or more persons to be able to transact business on your behalf if you are incapacitated. So for instance, let's say you take a fall, you're knocked out, you're in the hospital, but you have a business to run, you have deposits to make, you have withdrawals to make. If a person has authorized the durable power of attorney, their agent can go to the bank with that durable power of attorney and keep business going. With the durable power of attorney, it depends on the powers that we grant, but you can buy and sell real estate, you can create loans and accounts, you can open and close life policies. Anything that you personally could do when you're of your right mind, you can grant that power to a trusted individual to be able to do those things for you. And one of the problems, Dr. Joaquin, is that many people, you won't believe how many people call me and they'll say, oh, my brother was in an accident. He's in the hospital and I need a power of attorney. Brother, it's too late at that point because the last thing we want to do is get someone's authorization to give you power to do something. And they're on pain meds in the hospital. They're delirious. They don't know what they're doing. And they've signed away some power to someone. And it's a opening for fraud. It's an opening for malfeasance. And these are things we don't want to do. And this goes back to your first question. Why is it important to do estate planning as soon as possible? Because we never know when something's going to happen. And it's not an age thing. Something could happen to you on your way to work. That's the durable power of attorney. The way we draft them is such that the power only comes into play if you have been determined to be incapacitated. So that takes a doctor's note. We attach that to the power of attorney and then your agent can take care of business for you. There's a few other components. We also draft an assignment of personal property. We prepare memorial instructions. We prepare personal property memorandums. And those are the overall components of a comprehensive estate plan. So we know that's an estate plan from a personal perspective. How about if I owned a business? How does that work within the estate plan? Very good question. Many people never stop to think that businesses will also go through probate if the business owner or the partners have not planned for the demise of the business owner. So generally what we do, if someone owns an LLC or they're a S Corp shareholder, we will draft documents so that the LLC is actually owned by the living trust or the S Corp shares are owned by the living trust. So that's one way to keep your thriving business out of probate court. So my next question for you is for those who want to move forward with estate planning, what are their options? That's a good question as well, because there are, as I see it, three primary options. And if I would start at the most basic option is a person could try to create an estate plan on their own. We've already discussed the components of a comprehensive plan. And in most states, individuals can create their own estate plan by using maybe some online tools or getting some books, some template documents, that sort of thing. I don't recommend that because there is that whole issue of you don't know what you don't know. And many of these DIY plans are lacking so many essential components and then they end up not being effective. 
So that would be the least expensive, cheapest way to go, but it's probably not the most prudent way to go. The next step would be there are services called document prep companies. They are not attorneys, but they are fairly versed at putting together templates of these estate plan documents that I spoke of. And they'll charge a fee, they'll do a fact finder, it's very rudimentary, it's very basic. They'll basically take your facts and try to plug them in to their templates. There's not a lot of customization, there's very little planning at all that goes into it. And they will produce the documents. You are then on your own to get those things notarized and let's just hope that everything was put together based on what you really need and not just based on, you know, you filling in some questionnaire and them filling in the blanks. And then the third option would be to hire an experienced estate planning attorney where someone is going to sit down with you, interview you, ask questions about the important people in your life, ask about what's important about money to you, you know, tell me about your family dynamics. Is this a blended family? Are these children your joint children or are they stepchildren adopted? And then have an attorney put together a comprehensive plan that suits you and is done right the first time. And those prices are going to vary depending on who you do, who you hire, and if you decide to go with a professional. Since you mentioned pricing, so give us just an, a ballpark in terms of the low end to do it yourself to the actual sitting down with an estate planner such as yourself. I would say on the low end for a single person, if they wanted to use something like Legal Zoom or Rocket Lawyer, you can get a living trust done for maybe 500, 600 bucks. You're not going to get an, a comprehensive estate plan. It's just not going to happen. If you decide to go to a document prep company, you're going to be in the 2000 to maybe 2500 range. And they will provide you with these components that I spoke of, but they just won't be tailored. And then if you decide to go with an attorney, it's going to vary. I would say low end, maybe $2,500, $3,000, but you're going to find that those attorneys are cutting corners and basically just using templates themselves. For a family who has property in California, they have some children and they want it done correctly, you're going to be looking at upwards of $3,500, 4000 or more for a comprehensive plan from a licensed attorney who knows what they're doing. So my next question for you, let's say if someone reached out to you and lived in North Carolina, would they be able to use your services or do you have to be licensed in each of those states? Good question. I am not licensed in North Carolina and attorneys are required to only practice law in those states where they are licensed. The other issue is that a state law, probate law and trust law does vary from state to state. So if you're in North Carolina, there may be some advantages for you to hire a North Carolina attorney. If you're in California, it makes sense for you to hire someone who's versed and licensed in California. Now, the question may come up, well, what if I decide to move and I've had my estate plan done in California? Well, because of the full faith and credit principle that is held in the United States, if your estate plan is valid and legal in the state where it was created, when you created it, it will be honored by the other state. So if you move to North Carolina, that trust is still a valid trust. But I would still venture to say you might want to still consult with an attorney in that new state because maybe there's some benefits to have your trust amended to incorporate some of the benefits from that particular state. So my next question to you, what's some of the challenges for someone to continue to update their estate plan? Let's say if you, know, you have a home and then you purchased another home. So what's the process of updating that to get that, get your estate plan amended? 
In that particular example, it's very easy. You could go back to the original attorney or you could hire another attorney to add that property to your living trust. You could also go to an escrow company or a title company. They know how to add real property to a trust. That's one of the easiest changes because we don't actually have to change the drafting or terms of a trust to add assets to the trust. There's one component that we call Schedule A, where we list the assets that are held by the trust. But that changes because there are people flipping properties. And so that's one area that is easy to change, but doesn't necessarily have to be a part of the actual trust document. So how often should someone update their estate plan? There are a couple of guidelines or uh, milestones that we recommend But as an overall game plan, I would say every two to three years, you should be checking in with your estate planning attorney. We all know that depending on the stage of life you're in, maybe you've had a couple of more grandkids born since you had your original trust done. Maybe a successor trustee has passed away, or maybe one of your successor trustees has fallen on hard times and maybe they're not as dependable as they were when you named them as the successor trustee. Maybe people who are named in your estate plan have moved out of the area. It doesn't do you any good if you have a healthcare directive naming your brother as your healthcare agent, and now your brother's in Florida, and you're here in California. If you're in an accident, you need someone kind of close who can talk to the doctors on your behalf. At least that would be optimum. But otherwise, if there's decline in health, if there's disabilities that occur, if your financial situation has changed, let's say you win the lotto. Well, you probably need to have your estate plan redone or evaluated for an amendment. So there's several things that you should do, but at the very minimum, every two to three years a real life scenario because it happened with my family when we came in and and spoke to you. When we sat in the office and one of the things was is that you and your spouse have to be on the same page in terms of what you want in regards to the estate plan itself. You know, so if we look at the model, stage one, we talked about is internal, external ecosystem. Stage two is Mm -hmm. your financial genetic code. Stage three is reprogramming your financial genetic code in, in terms of healing. The healing piece of it is important as well in regards to stage six, which is generational knowledge equals generational wealth, stage seven, because you have two people coming into a relationship who have a different stage one stage two, stage three. So when you get to that point of financial planning or estate planning, they're not on the same page. So when you're talking to your clients, when you see that they're not on the same page, how does that affect in regards to actually putting the plan together itself? It tends to happen more when we have what we call blended families. Two people are married or you have partners who have children from previous relationships whether it's divorce or death. And so we come together and, you know, one of the questions will be, okay, so what do you want to have happen to your assets when you die? And then, you know, they kind of look at each other and one of them will say, well, I'd like, you know, my things that I've built and invested in to go to my kids and she wants stuff to go to her kids. But what about, you know, Jimmy? Well, Don't you want to give some of that to Jimmy? And the person will look and say, no, I wasn't really thinking about giving Jimmy (laughs) anything. So in those situations, the couple has to go back and kind of put their thinking caps on about how we really want this to transpire. Now, we can do a joint trust that has his wishes, her wishes, their wishes, But sometimes when people come from different relationships with bringing kids together, sometimes we advise them to have individual trusts done because it's much cleaner if you're coming into a relationship with your assets. Maybe you own two houses and have two kids and this other person has one house and four kids. It's cleaner for us to recommend doing individual trusts and that way there's no gray area about what's going to happen. 
But if people say, no, no, we want we want a joint trust, I help them by giving them scenarios and hypotheticals. Well, what happens if this? What would you do if this happened to your kids? So I try to help that process along, but ultimately they do have to be on the same page as to what they want to have happen. And sometimes it creates a roadblock and people may go away for two or three weeks while they're working out how they want it to unfold. I mean, we talk about the power of planning, but then we have those examples of those who didn't plan, right? And in particular in the African-American community, we come Aretha Franklin, Prince, Chadwick Boseman, all of these individuals did not plan and we thought that they did plan and they still have their assets in probate in some cases, right? So knowing that, knowing that's something that's universal within our community itself, Overall, is there any type of quantifiable data numbers about the percentage of individuals who do and do not have an estate plan in place? Yes, it's more than 50 percent of the population does not have an estate plan. And I would venture to say if you broke that down along ethnic lines, you probably would find it more in the uh, populations of people of color. So we talked about, you know, can a person create an estate plan, not really a plan itself. They can use LegalZoom or do the other service that you mentioned. You know, we talked about the estate planning process itself. But how does estate planning affect generational wealth? Well, one of the number one problems is that if people don't do proper planning, they may not lose everything, but they're definitely going to lose some value of the wealth they're trying to transfer. Because in all 50 states, there's this thing called probate. And probate is the process of transferring title from one person to another when a person dies. Now, probate can be done three ways. It can be done for people who do not have a will when they die. It can be done for people who do have a will when they die. And you have the people who have a living trust or even an irrevocable trust. It still falls under the probate code. But the probate code or the probate law says that if you have a living trust or a revocable trust, you don't have to come into court to take care of the retitling and the transfer of asset process. It's a private affair. So let's remove those people who have done proper planning. So now we're left with the people who have a will or they have no will. And I'll use just California. In California, if you die with a will, it does make it easier on your family because you are leaving instructions, but you don't get out of probate. Wills have to be probated. Probate fees are statutory in the state of California, meaning those fees are written into the law. And just to give your listeners an idea, a $1 million probate in California will cost $46,000 minimum to probate. A $1 million estate, and that could be assets, real property, money, boats, cars, whatever you own, if it totals a million dollars when you die, if you have to go through probate, it's going to be $46,000. Now, that money, where does it come from? It's going to come from your assets. That goes to the court. It actually goes to the attorney and your personal representative. So the attorney's going to get half of the 46 and your personal representative statutorily by law is entitled to the other half of that $46,000. Now, it doesn't matter if you have a mortgage on your house. You could have a million dollar house with an $800,000 mortgage. The probate fee is based on the value of the house, not the net value or the equity. In addition to that, probate takes anywhere from nine to maybe 24 months or more in California. Probate is a public affair. When a probate is opened, the person who's opening the probate has to file it with the court. There's public notices and there are vultures who actually look at these postings and these filings to see who they can go get and who has what and who's leaving what to their heirs. So that's where the reduction of generational wealth happens because people haven't planned and that 46,000 comes out of the assets. 
Now, here's another issue. The other issue is the timing. You have a million dollar house. Let's say it has a $500,000 mortgage on it and you're in probate. Who's going to pay that mortgage while your house is in probate? You want it to leave it to your kids. There's 500000 of equity. Do your kids have money to pay the mortgage? Is your brother and sister going to step in and pay the mortgage? So a lot of houses are lost in foreclosure through probate. And under the law, you're supposed to get that excess money. If they foreclose the house, you're supposed to get that excess money. But it's funny how that excess money never ends up in the hands of the people entitled to it. So that's how generational wealth is eroded when people don't plan. They could have spent $4,000 on an estate plan and saved the property and saved the 46 grand. And and that's why I was so adamant to start this podcast because there's a lot of narrative around generational wealth, but we're not getting the full story of how to create generational wealth. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I can get a life insurance policy. That's great. But again, as you mentioned earlier, you give the million dollars to a 21 year old. Well, generational wealth, how is that going to work without having a fiduciary? Right. So all of these aspects we speak about and we hear about consistently, a lot of it's on social media. They're not giving you the full story. It sounds good. Great intentions, but it's only half the story on how it actually happens. You know, I was watching ESPN and had an athlete. And one of the things he was mentioning was that buying a home and creating generational wealth. But immediately I thought about, okay, just because you buy a home does not mean you're creating <laughs> generational wealth. Because as you mentioned earlier, right. there are other episodes that can come into play that you can lose your property without actually planning correctly. So I'm glad you spoke about that. I'm hopeful that individuals are taking notes because it's so important. And that's why the model is such an intriguing model because it kind of speaks on every aspect of where you're at in your financial planning cycle, right? Because that's a cycle itself, you know, exactly where you're at. Yeah. Stage four, we know is financial edification which is financial literacy and financial inclusion, meaning go purchase homes. Yes, but without Mm -hmm. the proper planning, (laughs) absolutely, you can lose the home on your demise and it can be simply as incapacitated, as you mentioned earlier. There's so Mm -hmm. many things that happen within that estate plan that we're missing on. And I'm glad you was able to to touch on that. I mean, this has been just an an outstanding podcast. I'm glad that you came on because you kind of tie the bow to the model itself. So was extremely important to bring you on as our first guest on the New Wealth Way podcast because it sets the tone for what the narrative we're trying to portray on this podcast itself. What I really like about the model is that people can come into the model at any stage. And, you know, I have people who come together, they do an estate plan, but I can tell through the planning process and the engagement process that they still need some financial healing and they're still being influenced by their external and internal ecosystems. And they may not be very knowledgeable on the financial literacy piece, but you know what? It doesn't matter. Getting an estate plan together, even if you are not a guru, you don't have a lot of money, that's one vital component. As I was thinking about this podcast, I was thinking about when people don't do estate planning, it's like going around a monopoly board and then landing in jail, losing all your money, losing all your wealth, and the next generation has to start from scratch. And the component of planning early before you have early stages, Alzheimer or dis- dementia, is that you can be taken advantage of. Someone could draft a plan that doesn't have your best interest in heart. So you need to be fully aware, fully present when you're doing estate planning. A lot of times children will call and say, hey, my mom needs a living trust. And I'll find out, OK, mom's 90 and you know you're 60 and your other brothers and sisters don't even know that you're making the call and trying to get mom's estate plan together that's a recipe for disaster because invariably it's the kid who's living in the home with mom taking care of mom and all of a sudden mom's leaving everything to this kid and the other two have no clue that an estate plan was drafted so once again this is why if you're an older person the earlier the better 
don't wait till you get to a stage where you're losing all your faculties to start thinking about estate planning. So basically, there is really no age to begin to think about establishing the state plan. Once you be, once you have assets, basically, at that moment, you should start the process of getting the state plan in place. Yeah, I would say if we break it down even further, once you turn 18, now I don't expect 18 year olds to think, oh, well, you know, I'm, I just turned 18. I'm going to go get an estate plan. But once again, the generational knowledge piece that if the parents have knowledge, they could say you're 18 now. I need a power of attorney, a HIPAA authorization and a health care directive, because if you end up at Kaiser, I want to be able to come and give direction to the doctors. I want to be able to take care of your business. So that component is actually in the hands of parents. If you have children, young adults over 18, and let's say they haven't started a family, they're not out on their own. That's one component of estate planning that could be done. You may not own a house. But if you have children, you need at least to have a will because a will is the only component that would allow you to name guardians for those minor children if you die or if you're incapacitated. So you don't have a house yet, but you have kids, you need at least some estate planning. The next minute you get a property in California, it's gonna be, depending on where you live, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars and the probate costs are gonna be anywhere from 20 G's on up. And it's gonna be in probate for nine to 24 months if you don't have a living trust. So someone said, well, when should I start thinking about estate planning? My answer is, if there's loved ones who are gonna be left when you die, that's when you need to start thinking about estate planning. This has been, man, a lot of information. I mean, I'm going to have to go back and, and rewind this and write some stuff down as well because I need to get my stage six and more in order. I mean, this has just been an outstanding podcast. I want to thank you for coming on. So, you know, how do our listeners reach out to you? My web address is 360 EPI. That's Estate Planning Inc. 360EPI.com. That is the main place where you can get information about myself. There is a scheduling component uh, on the website. I'm also on Instagram. It's Martin C. Johnson ESQ. That's for Esquire. I generally will post some reels about some of these components we talked about. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. And so if someone wanted a consultation, I mean, what is the process of getting a consultation? First thing we would do is schedule a in-person consultation. I'm a big believer in meeting in person when you have these kind of things at stake. This is your legacy. This is generational wealth. These are your assets. Go meet the attorney, whether it's me or someone else, go meet with the attorney. So we would have an in-person consultation, get to know each other. I'll ask a lot of questions about your assets, what you're trying to achieve, who your family is, you know, some details about your family. And we talk 45 minutes to an hour. And then based on what you share with me, I can quote you an estimated fee. Once I quote that fee, it is a flat fee. So you don't have to worry about exorbitant fees, you know, being run up. I honor that flat fee. The process takes anywhere from four to six weeks, depending on the complexity of your uh, situation. Also, depending on how on the same page you are, if you have a significant other, if you're on the same page and you know exactly what you want to do, that process can be shortened. But if there's still some working through and some processes of who and how and how to design and what language to use, then the trust could take a little longer to to draft. And once uh, those four to six weeks are done, you now have your estate plan. We do all the transferring of assets into the estate, into the trust for you, and then you're set. You know, I appreciate that, Martin, for you to come on. I mean, this has been just outstanding. I mean, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for you coming on to the podcast itself. Future Wealth Builders, listen, <laughs> this is a powerful podcast for you to listen to. You know, we like to thank Mr. Martin C. Johnson, Esquire, estate planning you. attorney. You know, we want to thank you, Martin, for coming on. And for you listeners, generational wealth begins with generational knowledge. Until next time on the New Wealth Wave podcast. 
Thank you for joining us on the New Wealth Wave podcast hosted by Dr. Joaquin Wallace. Our show is edited and produced by Ray Haycraft. To dive deeper into the world of financial wisdom and learn how to create your financial footprints, head to our website at www.drjwallace.com. For more updates and exclusive content, connect with us on social media by searching Dr. Joaquin Wallace. And if you have questions and comments, feel free to email us at the New Wealth Wave Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, generational wealth begins with generational knowledge. And as always, thanks for listening. The content presented in this podcast is strictly for educational purposes and should not be taken as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed by our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the New Wealth Way podcast and its host or producers. Listeners are urged to exercise discretion and judgment before making any financial or investment decisions. Always consult with a financial professional or advisor before taking any action based on the content of this podcast. If you're enjoying the New Wealth Way podcast, we appreciate if you leave us a review. We're always open to topic suggestions and guest recommendations. Feel free to reach out to us directly with your thoughts and feedback. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the New Wealth Way podcast.